This is for olfaction. Now I'm going to completely switch gears and talk about warming. Uh, so, uh, because of the CO2, there is more trapping of radiation and temperature is going up. When uh, the CO2 is going up, the temperature is going up as well. It doesn't seem like a huge amount of, uh, a huge change in temperature, but it's a change that is big enough to trigger a lot of things. There is a lot of things that uh, are happening, and I will only talk about one of them that is one of the things that I work on. But I mean, really, to do this justice, I would need about a month of discussion, really. I mean, there's so much to talk about. So one of the things that I will be talking about today is just biological invasions. Because biological invasions are a very, very important thing. It's when animals are moved from one place to another. And, and global warming has a direct effect on the rate at which biological invasions are happening. F besides the fact that we are moving animals around, but also um, uh, just warming has a very, very big impact, particularly in fishes. And what I will be focus focusing on tonight is specifically what is happening in the Mediterranean Sea. So, the Mediterranean is getting warmer. Traditionally, the Mediterranean is, I mean, in a natural situation, if I can call it this way, uh, the Mediterranean is very, very uh, different. The eastern, basin, uh, the eastern basin is, in general, warm. The western basin tends to be uh, cold. However, the predictions are very different. With global warming, what we're going to experience is a is a Mediterranean that is going to... Is it me? No, it's not me, okay. I, I'm afraid to move around. Uh, the Mediterranean is going to start warming a lot. These are various predictions. And um, there are a lot of scenarios, but the bottom line is that the general trend is that the Mediterranean is going to get warmer and warmer. That's what is called the tropicalization of the Mediterranean. So just to make you appreciate what it really means in the very big picture, in a minute, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the history of the Mediterranean. So, the Mediterranean is as it is right now. You may be familiar with it or not. It's surrounded by Europe and Africa, essentially, and, and Asia a little bit on the, on the eastern side. But in the old days, the Mediterranean was extremely diverse. This slide shows where the epicenter of biodiver marine biodiversity is currently is the bottom right, is in the, what is called the Coral Triangle, which is Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Philippines. If you go to these places, you have thousands and thousands of coral reef species. Well, it has not always been the case. This epicenter of biodiversity has shifted over the years, and about 40 million years ago, it was centered around the Mediterranean. And this is shown by uh, an incredible array of beautiful fossils that are, for example, found in a place that is called Monte Bolca in Verona in Italy. Things changed dramatically when the Tethys Sea closed. When Africa and Asia collided, it closed off the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean was closed off from, from all the possibilities of speciation, and species started going down. But if this weren't enough, about six million years ago, Gibraltar closed up, and the entire Mediterranean dried up. It was completely dry. Five million years ago, you could walk at the bottom of the Mediterranean. Then Africa and Spain separated again a tiny bit. There was this huge waterfall for centuries that must have been really incredible to watch. And uh, fishes from the Atlantic came back in. So right now, there are only 540 fish species in the Mediterranean. It's actually very little. And the reason for it is because it's a very, very recent basin and very, very few are endemics that are only found in the Mediterranean, only 50 of them. So, with the tropicalization of the Mediterranean, we are actually going back into the old Tethys Sea, where there used to be a lot of tropical species. And there are a number of ways that this is happening. One of them is that the species that are found in the southern part of the Mediterranean are now slowly migrating north. Another thing is that uh, there are Atlantic invasions, but what I will be talking about tonight is actually Lesseptian invasions. Lesseptian invasions are species that are going into the Mediterranean from the Red Sea through the Suez Canal. 
And uh, so I just want very briefly to, uh, to talk a little bit about it. This is a satellite picture of the northern part of the Red Sea. There are two gulfs, the Gulf of Aqaba on the right, the Gulf of uh, Suez on the left. And at the top left, you can see the system of uh, the, the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was opened in 1869, but in fact, uh, ancient Egyptians, then Romans, and then eventually even Napoleon, everybody tried to open the canal, but failed, until uh, Ferdinand Lesseps, who is, was born in Versailles, and at least two people in this room are from Versailles, so, <laughs> so we have to be proud of it, and uh, my friend and myself. And... Uh, uh, I lived right next to this statue when I was a kid, and every time I said, one day I need to work on something about this guy, because I don't know who he is. And uh, so he opened the canal, maybe if you are uh, into opera, Aida was uh, actually created for the opening of the canal in 1869. And uh, it was like, an, if you are interested in this kind of thing, there is a beautiful book that is called Parting the Desert, that talks about the opening of the canal, and it's a crazy story. but. By doing that, it allowed some fish to go into the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is uh, a lot less salty than the, Medi than the Red Sea. And, and so uh, there is a little bit of a, of a barrier because of that, mostly because the Nile River goes into the Mediterranean right there, and so there is a lot of fresh water that is there. Unfortunately, in 1969, the Aswan Dam was created in the Nile, and uh, a lot less fresh water went into the uh, Mediterranean. The salinity of the two bodies of water became a little bit more similar, and fishes started to flow into the Mediterranean. On top of that, now because of global warming, the Mediterranean becoming warmer and warmer and becoming more and more similar to the Red Sea, more and more fishes are going in. Right now, there are about 300 species of marine organisms that have entered the Mediterranean, 80 of them being fishes. And the rate at which the Lesepsian migrants are going into uh, the Mediterranean is increasing at an alarming rate. In the old days, Hardly any species were there, and now between, between 10 and 20 new species every year are going into the Mediterranean. It's really uh, frightening what is happening. What is interesting about biological invasions is that there are a number of things that have been studied uh, that make us understand how organisms are capable of invading in the first place. You are invading an open niche. In the Red Sea, you have 3,000 species of fish. In the Mediterranean, 500. So there's a lot of ecological niches that are wide open. In the Mediterranean, there are only two herbivorous fishes. In the Red Sea, more than 100. So there is all this available habitat that they want to invade. Uh, there is low competition, because there are fewer individuals. There is low predation, and there is low parasitic load. You are going in a new place, there is the parasites that you left behind are not present in the new place. There are some genetic ex expectations as well. Uh, the genetic diversity of the invader needs to be very high to be successful, because it needs to adapt to a new place. And this is counter to another thing that is that usually few individuals go into the new place. And because few individuals go into the new place, actually their genetic background is very, very limited. It's what is called the genetic bottleneck. So there is this sort of uh, counterintuitive system where you have a lot of invasion, but it shouldn't be that way because only few individuals can get in. Uh, this that can be a little bit counteracted by large population growth and by strong acting selection. I'm going to get to that in a second. So I was interested in studying the genetics of Lesepsian fishes, and I looked at a number of them. Actually, very, very few uh, studies have been done on Lesepsian migrants, have done some, but uh, a few other people have done others. And imagine there are, only, there are 300 species and just a handful have been studied so far. These are some of the examples of the species that have been uh, studied. So first of all, the first question is, are there really population bottlenecks that are happening? That is, are all the individuals that are entering the Mediterranean 
stemming from just a few individuals, and so genetically they're all identical or not. This is just one of the results that we have. This is what is called a haplotype network. It shows the genes of the individuals that are in this species, which happens to be a, called a sweeper. And the individuals that are in the Mediterranean are red and blue. And as you can see, there is red and blue dots a little bit everywhere. This specifically means that it is not a bottleneck. A bottleneck, red and blue dots should be just one, and that's it. And here it's found everywhere. And this is just one example, but essentially almost all species that have been looked at don't show any evidence of bottleneck. And so there are, that's sort of this puzzle where you have successful invaders and no bottleneck, and you're wondering how is it possible. And so there's a number of possibilities. One is that actually there are old invasions. And so over time, more and more individuals are coming in and eventually, well, you know, slowly you're going to build up genetic diversity in the invading population. Multiple invasions happening at the same time, but multiple of them. And you can have just an invasion in large numbers. That's another possibility. Another possibility that is not shown here is that actually the invasion is much, much worse than this. But all the invaders that have a bottleneck die off, and the only ones that we're actually looking at are the ones that are surviving. So that's definitely a possibility. One of the problems that I have, I'm sorry to just diverge for one second, is that the best place to study that would be in the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal is not a place you want to work at. Well, every time we go there, you have really to be fond of Kalashnikov to go in there. It is <laughs> terrible. And there are cannons everywhere. And also, I work a lot with Israeli colleagues and with Lebanese colleagues and with Tunisian colleagues. And I have to not talk at the same time to the people. And it's very, very sad because all of them are unbelievably wonderful scientists. And they would love to be able to cooperate, and their governments don't allow them to do that. So this is another layer of problems that I find incredibly unfortunate. So one of the species that we worked on is the cornet fish. It's a very, very bizarre species, the blue-spotted cornet fish. And it's a recent invader, just showed up in 2000. It's conspicuous. It looks like nothing, that, nothing else that is found in the Mediterranean. It's a large species that looks just like a pipe. And uh, in five years, it invaded the entire Mediterranean very, very quickly. And when you do the genetics of this guy, it actually shows evidence of bottleneck. You see, this is a, a phylogenetic tree of all the guys from everywhere. The ones from the Mediterranean are in blue. There is only two genotypes that are found in the Mediterranean at the level of this one marker. So it shows, wow, well, actually, finally, we find, so find something that shows some bottleneck. And there is all sorts of story about this, and I just don't have much time to talk about them, but it's very, very interesting. The way it invaded was very, very quickly. This is the spread of the species with the years that are going by, and it was very, very quick. And in just five years, it went through the entire Mediterranean. In fact, it's so well recorded because it looks so unusual that it's possible to track its precise path. So uh, this is how it uh, spread over the years in the Mediterranean. And you can exactly follow how it moved around in the Mediterranean. Really, really interesting. So one of the things that I was interested in is, okay, there's a population bottleneck. One of the possibilities is actually it's subjected to very, very strong selection. And maybe if it's subjected to very strong selection, even if there are few genotypes, the selection is so strong that some genes are maintained in the population that is allowing it to, sp to spread out. This is very, very difficult to study, but now with the new genomic techniques, you can do that very, very efficiently. So again, one of the type of response is natural selection. So the way we did it is by using a technique that is called rat sequencing. This is not looking at the expression of genes. Now we are looking at the chromosomes, the DNA itself of the organisms. And the way it's working is that ideally, I'm no, not even sure if ideally is the right term, but one thing that you could do is just sequence the entire genome of hundreds of individuals and see if they are different. Well, it's really not very practical because the genome is humongous. It would be very expensive and you would have more data than you really need. So another possibility is just to look at small fragments of DNA that 
are in very specific places. And the way we do it is that we cut the DNA with a restriction enzyme. This happens to be SBF1. That's the name of the enzyme. You cut the DNA in those fragments that are very well known. And then you're going to just sequence a very small fragment just where those red arrows are. And you're going to compare these fragments. So what you have is you have a representation of the entire genome but without sequencing the entire thing. You just sequence a little bit. And by doing that, with relatively little money, you can sequence a lot of individuals. So that's what we did. These are the sequences. You compare them. You, it's what you call, you stack them. And then when you have those stacks of sequences, you just look at the positions that are variable. And you're just focusing on those variable positions. And then you're going to determine, OK, is this evidence of selection or not? And does it, ma does it match anything that we know or not? So we have the restriction enzyme. Uh, just on the back of the envelope calculation, you are expecting 30, 36,000 cuts. And then the number of individuals that we studied, we, we took 44 individuals from the Red Sea, 31 from the Mediterranean. So we essentially sequence. 44 genomes, so this is huge amounts of data sets, and they are saying, okay, is there any evidence of selection on that? So this is just a plot of the number of reads, of unique reads per individual. So this is all the individuals, and you see it's roughly 44,000 44, uh, genes, or sorry, fragments of DNA were sequenced for each individual on average. And then the number of variable sites are here, and there's about 5,800 variable sites on average per individual. So now what you're going to do is that you're going to calculate the average FST. For one second, I'm going to try to explain what FST is. When individuals are moving from one place to another, they're carrying with them some genes. If everybody was moving constantly and genes were completely mixed, the value of FST would be zero. If the individuals are never moving and completely separate, uh, the FST value would be one. So the value of FST varies from what we call panmixia, from zero, to absolute separa genetic separation one. And when you're looking at movements of individuals, you can also calculate the average value of FST. So whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. So in this species, we're going to calculate what the average FST is. Now, what is interesting about it is that if some regions of the genome are under selection, the value of FST will be different. And the reason for it is because, because there is selection on this region of the genome, when you have the bad, the, the, a copy of this genome that is bad, you are actually dead and you are not participating in the thing. So effectively, you are biasing a region of the genome that is under selection, and artificially, you are increasing this value of FST. If you haven't understood this, it doesn't matter. It's just like all my students at UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> uh, don't worry, you're in good company. The only difference is that probably you're not stoned right now. That's the only difference. <laughs> Maybe some of you are, I'm not sure. Um, so then what we do is what we say, uh, we estimate FST outliers, which is trying to determine if there are any genes that are under selection. So this is the distribution of those uh, 6,000 or so, 7,000 loci. This is the distribution, and this is the value of FST at the bottom. So you can have an, an average FST, and then you're going to look at the tail and see what's going on. So here is you have standard deviations in the curve, and then what is to the right of the standard, of three standard deviations is really way far out. Very, very different than what you're expecting. And in fact, we found 17 of those loci, 17 of those fragments. There is a lot more that is interesting to the left of that. I won't talk about it, but right now these are the 17. Now, those 36,000 regions on average, they have no reasons to be on genes. They could be on anything because only 5% of the genome is genes. Yet, out of those 17 loci, eight of them were protein-coding genes, which is more than 5%, about 50% or so. And the first gene has to do with osmoregulation. 
and then you have a, a, a number of other genes, and then the genes that are below that, almost all of them are involved into osmoregulation. So clearly, when you are passing through the Suez Canal, something that is going to squeeze the population very, very much is the capability for the larva or the adult, whatever is passing through, to be able to cope with a change in salinity when you're going through the canal and going into the Mediterranean. So you have very, very strong selection at this level. And that's maybe what is explaining why you, have, you can have a bottleneck and at the same time very strong selection. So the, one of the future plans for this uh, species is that right now we're sequencing the full genome and be able to locate exactly where those regions are and things like that. Okay, I just want to uh, briefly mention, just to wrap this up, uh, a number of future directions, not just about my lab, but about the field in general. You know, it's a very, very new field. I mean, the last things that are happening now, I mean, even three or four years ago, were absolutely not, uh, not even on the radar. Uh, one uh, a paper that just came out a few days ago that I thought was really great uh, is uh, Evolution in an Acidifying Ocean. Uh, it's uh, published in Trends in uh, Ecology and Evolution and by a Canadian and an Australian team. And right now, by doing this grand experiment of putting so much CO2 in the atmosphere, we are driving this very, very rapid evolution of a number of organisms. I study fishes, but it's true for a lot of different things. And this is incredibly, uh, I don't know even what to say, interesting, fascinating, dangerous, scary, you know, it's every, everything. It's really, a, it's really something. And so I think that we really need to fully understand what's going on to maybe appreciate where we should prioritize our efforts in trying to change things. Another thing that I would like to show you is this slide. I love this picture. That was the, the, the introductory slide. And this picture says a lot, I think. This looks great. And this is terrible. Uh, it looks great because it's beautiful. It's a picture taken in Puerto Rico. So in Puerto Rico, there is no lionfishes. And as you can see, there's a number of lionfishes on this picture. These lionfishes have been introduced artificially in, uh, in the Caribbean, and now they are completely invading the Caribbean. They're found everywhere. In their native places, the Coral Triangle, if you go to the Philippines, you never see them. The reason for it is because they have predators over there. So they only come out at night. This is a picture taken in broad daylight. In broad daylight, you never see that in, uh, in the Pacific, where they are native fr from. Uh, so first thing, with an increase in temperature, we're going to have more and more of these invasions. And another thing that is happening here is that the Caribbean is being wiped out by these guys. And the reason for it is because the babies of all the native species of the Caribbean cannot recognize the smell of these guys as predators. And so you have this biological invasion that is bad enough, and then you have this dampening of olfactory senses on the baby fishes, and there are videos, I just didn't bring one here tonight, where you see these guys that during the daytime, they just go close to the baby fish and they just eat them just one by one. It's incredible. And so there is a, a friend of mine, uh, Louis Rocha, who works at the Cal Academy. He studies a uh, unique species of wrasse that is only found in one island in Belize. And he went there, and it's almost completely extinct because it's full of these guys, and these guys are just eating the larvae one by one. And the larvae have no clue of what's going on. And so that brings together these two stories of biological invasion and ol olfactory senses. And these kind of stories that right now seem so bizarre, I think are going to be more and more common. So that's, uh, that's not great. So just to uh, finish, I'd like to acknowledge the people that I work with. Uh, the uh, ocean acidification part is done with uh, Cheryl Logan and Scott Hamilton. And we've done a lot of work we use the uh, acidification aquariums at Ambari, and uh, we are funded mostly by a California Sea Grant. And uh, for the uh, Lesepsian uh, work, I work with Ernesto Azzurro. Uh, he's here trying to pretend not to be seen and try to catch fish in the Suez Canal. And he's uh, reading a, a book by uh, Danny Golani. 
and uh, Danny and, uh, and Ernesto and I are, have been working on this uh, for a very long time, and then other uh, collaborators as well. And we are funded by a number of uh, agencies, mostly, uh, mostly from Europe. Finally, uh, next month, you will get to see a talk that is going to be absolutely incredible, and I would love to hear about it, but I can't because my wife is actually on the boat and she's preparing the slides for next month's talk. So Nicole Crane will be here and she will be talking about her, uh, her adventures in, uh, in Micronesia. She is doing some amazing stuff uh, that is uh, uh, fisheries restoration and management in a uh, uh, changing uh, uh, world and uh, it deals with climate change and, uh, and fisheries. So uh, I encourage you to go to see her talk. I'll be here most probably, and we'll be here with our kids. They have heard these things so many times, they're just sick of going to those places, but that's another story. <laughs> they're begging us, take us to places where there are lots of tourists, we don't want to go to remote places. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>